All right, well, let's get into my Docker presentation. By raise of hands, who's heard of Docker? All right. So that's appropriate. We're going to start with, what is Docker? <laughs> Docker is a para-virtualization. That is to say, it's operating system level virtualization. That's in opposed to hypervisor virtualization, which operates at a lower level. Uh, another thing that's in, uh, novel about Docker is that it's stacked. And that is to say we can have an image that's based off another image that's based off another image that's based off another image. Uh, it's built upon Git for the image management. Easy to deploy is one of its big features, supposedly. And platform portability, which we'll see a little bit more in a second. So why would you want to use Docker? Well, there are a lot of good uh, reasons, and we'll talk about comparing it to a virtual machine in the next slide. But uh, mostly, it's that they're self-contained, lightweight, easy to deploy. We can spin up new instances of images of Docker on other servers really, really quickly. We can get up and going with a new image in seconds, which we'll see in my demo. Uh, and I put coordinate development efforts. Apparently, that is one of the things that's supposed to be able to do is supposed to allow us to coordinate development efforts. I don't fully understand it, but that is one of the things they claim. So, versus a virtual machine. So, the advantages of para-virtualization over uh, full-on hypervisor virtualization is simply that we don't have to have a whole guest OS layer be before all, each of our apps to run. And that's good for a couple of reasons. The biggest being is the better utilization of resources and native performance. Better utilization resources is we're not wasting a bunch of memory for the OS to run. We're not wasting um, disk space for the OS. All that stuff is kind of done away with. We're just using system memory. So it's just like processes using, using memory. Um, but we still get a lot of isolation between these images. So uh, just like on a guest OS, or sorry, a virtual machine, this virtual guest can't interfere with this virtual guest. The same is true with the Docker. So they have the same isolation as a virtual machine, which is why it's often get lumped together. Uh, and it's why you call it parent virtualization, but it's not. Okay, so how does it do it? Well. It uses a bunch of stuff that was kind of already there and just kind of pulls it all together. Um, but they do have something called the Advanced Multilayered Unification File System, or AUFS. <clears throat> that is the secret behind having a file system and then putting another image on top that uses that same file system but can make its own uh, file edits, remove files, add files, that kind of thing. And that's primarily at the heart of the file system part of Docker. It uses libvirt, which is a virtualization library, which then in turn uses LXC, which is Linux containers, which is the parallel para virtualization framework, which in turn uses Linux namespaces, which is a technology that helps you isolate different processes into groups so they can't you know, see each other or coordinate. And then on top of that, they added uh, this concept of a virtual NIC in these para virtualization containers and shared mounts, which we'll talk a little bit more about. So one of the biggest confusion in Docker is a nomenclature between an image and a container. So we're going to talk about that in one second, or talk about it right now, actually. <laughs> an image is something that we're going to base off of and our, base our container on top of, and our container is an actual running instance of an image. So that is to say, you can't run an image. Once an image is running, you're running it in a container. But the, also that the image is read-only, and the container doesn't exist without the image. So the container only exists when it's running, right? It's a little, bit, a little confusing, but I think you'll understand by the time we're done. Uh, so here's kind of the workflow. We have these images. Images might be uh, a really small, slimmed-down install of Debian, or Ubuntu, or CentOS. And then on top of that, maybe we have another layer of this is a uh, Node.js server, or this is a uh, PHP server, or this is a MySQL server. And then on top of that, you might have applications built. For example, this is TeamLab, or this is uh, 
Give me open source projects. <laughs> yeah, I mean .NET is ASP.NET is a, a good one. Uh, so they, that's that's kind of the nature of how the stacking works. Um, and then the uh, the secret is once you get a container just so, just the way you like it, you can quote unquote check it in, and it now becomes an image in which you can base off of. Now, one common question you might have in this is what happens if I want like user data? Let's say I don't want it to check into the image because it's not really part of my app. It's, it's data that my app requires. Well, they have something for that, some extreme, which we'll talk about in a minute. <laughs> okay, so here's the basic commands we're going to see in just a second. Uh, Docker pull is going to pull an image from Docker IO, Docker Hub, sorry. Uh, Docker run is going to run an image. Docker PS is going to show us the list of running containers. Docker PS with the container name or GUID, which we'll see in a sec, is going to show us what exactly is running inside of that container. Docker attach allows us to attach our terminal into a container and then we're inside the container. Uh, Docker stop will stop our container and Docker images will show us the list of images we have available already downloaded. Okay, so here's the simple hello world. We'll actually do this, but we're going to just talk about the commands for a minute. So Docker pull, like we talked before, is going to get this image name from Docker IO. Now you'll notice they mostly have a, uh, a slash in them. This kind of has a namespace about it. And only baser images like Debian, uh, Ubuntu, all those baser images are just one word. But when, you're <coughs> but when it's more complex, then you use the slashes to help segregate or describe namespace those images. <clears throat> so after we get that image, then we can run it. So we say docker run and then the image name. This stuff right here is actually going to be passed in as parameters to that instance, that image of docker when it runs. <clears throat> docker images, we're gonna see that we have images. Docker PS, we're gonna see it running. So if I can open up putty for a minute and we're going to Hit one of my servers for a second, if you guys can see that. So, let me see if I can make that bigger. Let's see if that does it. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay. Got a login or it's gonna kick me off. Okay. I'm just gonna sudo right in the, the bash just so I don't have to put sudo in front of every Docker command. <laughs> okay. So if I say Docker images, it's gonna show me that I've got these images. So I've got one called Ubuntu, one called Microsoft ASP.NET, one called Debian, one called Hello World, one called CentOS, one called OnlyOffice, and one called Training Web App. Now, it's interesting to see here that <clears throat> we have, for example, Debian and CentOS. Uh, this is a Debian install, but we can actually run CentOS inside of Debian with very minimal overhead. It's just going to replace just the files it needs to. It's really kind of cool. <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is say docker pull and then what was it called? Well, say so here's the git layer getting the different check-ins of this image okay, I now have the that image, so now I can say And then see if it works. There we go. That's all it does. <laughs> if I had the color console on, you'd see colors. But all right. So now, if we say Docker PS, we don't have anything running because this particular container uh, shuts down as soon as it's done with what it's doing. If I do Docker images. We'll see, I now have the new Docker Wellsay image. 
And that was pretty quick for pulling down 247 megabytes, geez. <laughs> okay, so what did I leave off? Mounts. Mounts is the secret to uh, how it is you save data, user data for these. Like if you're gonna spin up an instance of MySQL, you'd certainly wanna mount to put those databases so they're persistent. So if that Docker container gets shut down, you still have your data. Uh, networking. So the networking, the way it works is I told you they had these virtual uh, NICs. What happens is inside the Docker, it's going, ahead, going to go ahead and open up port 80. And you can have every Docker image open up port 80, but they map back to the host to some other random port, or you can specify as you start it up what port you want them to, to dock to. At that point, you've got to use a reverse proxy if you want to use the Squid Web. So you'd use either Squid, Nginx, something to reverse proxy for it, and then forward it to that port, which arguably you'd be doing anyway for caching, so it's not that big of a deal. But it can be annoying for other applications that don't have a virtual proxy ability. For example, an SMT, SMTP server, you'll still only be able to have one of those running. You can check in. We did talk about the check-in. Uh, and to build a, a, like a brand new image, you basically build what's called a uh, Docker build file. And then it's just going to describe what you're basing your image off of, what files you want to include in it, and a shell script to run when it does run. And that's it. Any questions? Right. By yeah, let me give you an example. So, where, where, would, it, where would you find something like this the handiest? Handiest? It's handiest for getting things up and running fast. So, you'll notice I've got only Office Community Server. This is what we use at Mindfire for uh, user management, project management, CRM, all those kinds of things. It's a big, huge, honking install. <coughs> it took me days to get it run up and running and configured correctly. <clears throat> I pulled this image in a matter of minutes and if when I run it, it just runs. So in other words, Docker, you get this set up and then Docker takes it and makes it. It's an application as an image. So there's no install, mm -hmm. there's no the environment doesn't change from from Did computer you, machine to machine. What about The resources are managed just like the operating system would manage them normally. So, it's, in fact, they are regular processes. They're just running in an isolated section. So, so Docker, that's what Docker does, is it provides yep. the isolated set. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So all the system memory is intact. Uh, the other might, thing I might say that I did leave out is uh, it's actually a little bit, I don't know the word difficult, it's a little bit more work to get two Docker images to coordinate because there is so much segregation between them when you don't want that as much. Uh, it's a little bit difficult. But this is kind of the, the whole scheme we're going. We're trying to, like the whole world's pushing towards microservices right now. And Docker and microservices just go hand in hand. They're a perfect platform for microservices. So. So in essence, you could deploy just the whole thing. I mean, in other words. The, That's the idea. The, the computer, I mean, in a sense that <laughs> Another question that's, that's common is, can I run this on Windows? Yes. The caveat is that it is essentially running a virtual machine of Linux, yeah. and you're just managing it through Windows command line. Uh, I think it would be a really cool project for someone to do something like this for Windows and .NET. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the concept is isolation and having an app kind of be all encapsulated and containerized. Those are all good things I'd love to see. Windows does not run in Dockers? You, could maybe in theory do that, but I don't think that would be mostly, mostly Unix based. Linux, okay. Other questions? Cool.